Disclaimer! The following contains spoilers for X-Men Dark Phoenix. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned. Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. And this week... Ah... Uh, fuck. We're talking about Dark Phoenix. Cue the music. Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. My name is Scott James Meridew, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and are joined each week by a very special different guest. She's been on the show before. Give it up, capers, for Dara Burke. Hey. How's it going? Good. Not that good, though. Not that Not good. Not for Dark Phoenix. Not for Dark Phoenix. Oh, I mean. Oh, God. I mean, I fucking love X-Men. I want to get that out of the way. I love X-Men. Love the film series to varying degrees. Like, yeah. Uh, sometimes it's it's really good and sometimes it's not. I mean, I just remember very clearly the first movie coming out uh, when I was eight years old. And I really wanted to go and see it because I really love the cartoon. I love the comics and stuff. But my parents right. said, no, you can't see it because that's rated 12 here in the UK. And you're fucking eight years old. We're not that media savvy, but we know that's probably not appropriate. And they were, <laughs> they were kind of right. And it was until a while later I was able to see it. And both me and my sister, actually, who's not really uh, into the superhero stuff anymore, uh, really loved it. And then X2 came out and we really loved it. And then The Last Stand came out. And then that's when the cracks started to appear in the veneer. To which I... (laughs) Which we can blame partially, not entirely, but partially, on the director and writer of the film we're talking about today, Simon Kinberg, that rat bastard. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I I I don't know anything about Simon Kinberg personally. Maybe he's a lovely no. person. Maybe he's a piece of shit like Brett Ratner. Who knows? All I know is the vast majority of his films are complete and utter shit. Let's, uh, this is the only film he's ever directed. Let's look at some of the films he's written. Uh, let's see. Triple uh, X, State of the Union. Shit. Mr. Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Okay, if you're in the right mood. Uh. Last Stand, which he co-wrote with Zach Penn, who is a pretty good writer, I will say... A co also co wrote uh, Avengers Assemble, uh, shit for the most part. Jumper, mm-hmm. fucking hate Jumper. Okay, actually, you know what? Side tangent. I think I've talked about this before, but I want to fucking talk about Jumper. When I was a kid, uh, two thousand and eight, Jumper. I saw a trailer for a movie. And I thought, holy crap, that looks amazing. That looks so cool. And I was, I, it, I was so obsessed with this movie. I would go into the website of the movie because back then you had like websites for the movies yeah. and I was like checking up on it and update seeing if it outdated every single day I was obsessed with watching this movie and then I went and saw it and it was a piece of shit starring the fucking bad Anakin Skywalker so uh yeah he's kind of I kind of hold him responsible for that especially when years later I actually checked out the books of Jumper and they're actually really good so uh and then you got, uh, the next year, you got Sherlock Holmes, which is pretty good. I will give him that. Follow- yeah. Followed by This Means War. Shit. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Okay. Uh, it's okay if you're in the right mood. Yeah. And yeah, it's a very specific mood to have to be in. X-Men Days of Future Past, which I think is great, in all yeah, fairness. But then it's followed by two movies. In 2016, X-Men Apocalypse, which everyone agrees is not that great at best. And possibly the worst superhero movie I have ever seen. Worse even than Dark Phoenix, I will say that. fan Four stick Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't even see that one. I couldn't bring myself to watch it. Good. Don't. I mean, I'd even recommend... Like, honestly, honestly, uh, I don't want to give too much away of my thoughts about this movie too early on. But I will say... If you've got a three afternoon and you want to go to the cinema and you've seen everything else you could possibly want to see and that's out right now, you could do worse than Dark Phoenix. Is it good? No, it's fucking not. But I honestly think you could do worse. I would never recommend Fan 4 Stick. 
ever to anyone. It remains my most unpleasant cinema going experience to date. And here's the big question I have. <clears throat> Why did Simon Kimberg keep getting work after Fan Forstick? I'm not saying he should be blacklisted. I'm not saying he could never ever write anything of worth ever again. But there are so many great screenwriters who are struggling to get jobs in Hollywood, in the film industry right now. And yet the guy who wrote that pile of absolute motherfucking dreck still gets two movies, two major theatrical movies in the same genre as the one that is regarded as some of the one of the worst examples of the genre. No! No! He is the E.L. James of superheroes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, um, that would be right. Yeah. Uh, maybe that, maybe that's going too far, but it's just like, no one is giving E.L. James any writing jobs right now. I mean, I think she's done like a few things here and there, but no one takes her seriously. Why is this guy being taken seriously? I have nothing against the guy personally, and I wouldn't say this to his face because I'm too much of a coward, but... <laughs> But why? Why? And even after X-Men Apo Like, I get why he got jobs after Days of Future Past, because that was a good movie. But even after, after Fan Four Stick and Apocalypse, both of which were poorly received, surely you'd want to give this to guy to this 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 job to someone else, surely? Really? I mean and there's probably other examples of his work that <laughs> Possibly even worse than the ones we've mentioned. I mean, dear God, are there, are there any others? Uh, he, I mean, he was, he's produced lots of other stuff. But in terms of uh, writing, he's, it's just, it's, it's, no, no. Like, any, look at some of the stuff he's produced. He produced Logan, Murder on the Orient Express, Deadpool 2, uh, The Martian, uh, X-Men Days of Future Pass again. And a lot, a lot, lots of other stuff. So clearly he's actually quite good at producing. And he's been on, but, produced some quite good stuff. Just let him be a fucking producer. Yeah. Uh, uh, being a good producer doesn't mean you're going to be a good writer. No. no. I, I, maybe he's been a writer long he's, but he's been a producer. But still, like, know where your strengths lie. Because clearly, maybe at one point it was with uh, X-Men Days of Future Past... But uh, not, not, not anymore. And that's really the only example we can think of that that works. And, I mean, he he wrote the screenplay for that. But he worked on the story with Matthew Vaughan and Jane Goldman. So, and well, he, did, he did not work on the story, as far as I'm aware, with anyone else on this movie. Okay. So... <laughs> And it's clear, that says to me, that says to me, that Fox were just like, okay, you know what, let's just, let's just shit this one out. Let's just get it out of the way, get it done, and then we're done with X-Men. Oh, what's that? New Moons? Oh, fuck, well, after this, we're done with X-Men. And uh, I want to talk about New Mutants once we're done. I fucking want to talk about that, because I've, I've learned something about that recently, and it makes me very fucking angry. I don't know if you could tell, I'm kind of fucking angry. <laughs> I can tell, so I think we should just talk about this movie, talk about its story, talk about its characters. And there are some good stuff in this movie. There is some things that is worth talking about and we're going to do that. Let's just go through it. So this is the culmination of the uh, soft reboot of the X-Men film franchise with X-Men First Class, which took place in the 1960s. Followed by right. X-Men Days of Future Past in the 1980s, followed, so in the 1970s rather, followed by Apocalypse in the 1980s. It's now the 1990s and everyone looks the same! Yeah, no one aged. Fuck it, I'm like, I mean, let's, ex let's assume, just for a second, that Hank McCoy, played by Nicholas Holt, was 20, minimum, in the 1960s when... Uh, first class was set. It's now the 1990s. He should be in his 50s, 60s even. Like, yeah. I, he, and he looks exactly the same. He, I mean, Nicholas Holt, in fairness, 
looks like a baby and always will do because he's a cutie pie. He really is. But right, <laughs> it's 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 insane. It's insane. It's just like if you're not going to age up the characters or replace them with new actors, then you might. Well, then why set it a decade later? Why this all could have still been in the seventies, all yeah. the eighties, even. It really didn't need to be set of the 1990s and it's and it's also set in 1992 the year i was born so like this combined with aladdin being released the same year and just my birth year is turning out to be pretty goddamn shit oh no yeah that didn't make any sense either because the original x-men movies came out in 2001 and patrick stewart and ian mckellen played they were thinking with the timeline yeah, yeah, it's 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 really fucking stupid. <laughs> I mean, I I can take it a bit because it's like suspension of disbelief. But even then, I mean, this takes place eight years. I mean, Michael Fassbender, look at his face. I mean, he's like what in his forties at the very very latest. I don't know his actual age, and he's supposed to believe in eight years he looks like Ian McKellen. No, no, <laughs> that this is why you said it in the goddamn nineteen sixties to begin with. Because Matthew Vaughn knew what he was doing. Why isn't he still making in these movies? Because he's moving on to bigger and better things. Because he's Matthew Vaughn. And clearly. He's, clearly. But anyway, actually, it takes place... We should, it starts... Now, we start with the title screen. X-Men Dark Phoenix. Or Dark Phoenix. Or Dark Phoenix X. Depending upon <laughs> however they start this movie. And the uh, first thing I noticed was... There's no fucking intro. There's no like dum da dum da 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 na 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 zooming down a corridor. There's CGI and some cool design choices. We don't get that. We just get a title. It's just like oh, so they really don't give a crap now. Yeah, they didn't didn't care. <laughs> Not at all. And uh, we so we open actually in the 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 1970s, 1975. With Jean Grey, she's on a car trip with her mum and her dad, and then suddenly she gets transported to the Rock of Eternity. Up, uh, up, uh, uh, No, no, that's that, that was that's a good. Super- movie. That was a, that was a good. That was a good superhero movie. No, no, actually, she just wants to listen to uh, her music on the radio, and she uses her telekinesis to change the radio station. It's like, oh, it's kind of cool. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> so she causes a car accident. Boy, that escalated quickly. Yeah. That uh, seemingly kills both of her parents. And then uh, she's uh, met with uh, Professor Charles Xavier, played by... Uh, what's his face? Uh, James McAvoy, that's it. Who's like, hey, so real sorry, your parents are dead. Everyone doesn't really know what to do with you. And she's just like, I'm a freak, can't I? And he's like, no, 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 no. Well, yes, but I can help. And he takes oh he takes her to his mansion. And at this point, I'm getting like some Bruce Wayne vibes off of this. Ugh. And yeah. it basically says like I can help. Like like there's nothing really wrong with you, okay? There's some issues we need to work through, but there's nothing to fix. There's just like stuff we need to work on. And it's actually a pretty sweet moment. And I will admit. There's a lot of scenes in this movie between Charles and Jean as she grows up and when the bad things start to happen. And I will admit, maybe you could argue the actors aren't giving it their all, but these are very good actors who are trying a little bit, so it kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell that it's like a father-daughter relationship a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of sweet and... And uh, then we flash forward to the year 1992. And uh, remember the end of Apocalypse when they we had that final shot of all the X-Men in all of their unique costumes like they had in the uh, comics and cartoons? Well, that's gone! They've all got the same outfit, matching outfits. And I will admit the outfits are better than the very first X-Men movie where they just wore all the black leather. Like, I know yeah. that was what they was wearing their comics at the time, but I much prefer the, just, like, the X and stuff. Although the black thing, and it's kind of simple, but it's it clearly shows, again, they didn't want to spend too much on the costumes because, I mean, those... I mean, they don't look cheap, but they... I mean, I feel like I could pick those up at a comic convention. Like... Yeah. 
they're not they're not great and i wouldn't have minded if it weren't for the fact that the last movie we got all sorts of cool, like cyclops had his cool like silver visor and, and storm had a cool outfit and shit and it's like no we don't we don't get that anymore no we got the same outfit but yeah. here's an interesting thing ever since they kind of saved the world last decade uh, the x-men have become uh, kind of like celebrities and mutants have generally become more accepted Charles has been working closely with the American government. He has a phone jacked directly to the Oval Office. Swanky. Yeah, that reminded me of like um, Powerpuff uh, Girls. Was, yes, Powerpuff Girls, where they <laughs> they had the phone to the mayor, and I was just like, that's that's funny. Professor, there's a mutant destroying New York. Well, I better summon the X-Men. Sugar, spice, and everything nice did not go into them. It's just good genetics. <laughs> and and, and it, I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> for, because for so long, the X-Men have been, you know, trying to save a world that hates and fears them. And now the world doesn't really hate them and fear them anymore. They've been working very hard towards equality. And they've still got ways to go. But you know what? They're making progress. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. And it turns out, uh-oh, there's a space shuttle in danger, the Endeavour, which, as far as I'm aware, uh, was a real spaceship that launched in the 1990s. Yeah, 1992. So, you know, actually playing with actual history here. I'm sure nothing could go wrong there. <coughs> oh, Bay of Pigs. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, and, uh-huh. and, so, and so Charles is like, okay, everyone, suit up. Let's go and save that space shuttle. And Mystique is like, whoa, slow your roll there, Charles. Should we really be doing this? Should we really be going into space and risking kids' lives? Even though they're not kids anymore. They must have to be in their 20s, if not 30s at least. Uh, mm. For, you know, space shuttle, something that we've never done before and we're not equipped for. And Charles is like, ah, she'll be right. You know, just what could go wrong? It's only space. Yeah. And so they right. go, they go, up into space, and then they see, oh my god, it's Parallax! Wait, no, 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 to the left of it. Oh my god, it's the cosmic cloud that gave the Fantastic Four their powers! No, further left. Oh my god, it's a solar flare, finally. I mean, it looks exactly like those other things. I know, it did. I was like, the super, the, the super powerful random thing that nobody names. Oh no! It also it also looks like Galactus from the third Fantastic Four movie. Second. Oh yeah. Uh, technically second. third. Okay. Third overall. Second in terms of like the story ones. Uh, fucking fan. You know what? I'm just glad Marvel is choosing to fix that before X Men. Just like sort that out. Yeah. We'll deal with the X shit later on. But anyway, and so they're like, oh no, there's a. <laughs> There's a, the, the, the solar flare is going towards the space shuttle. If only we had someone on board who could travel long distances just by thinking. And thankfully they, they do. But the spaceship is spinning too fast. And because Nightcrawler does not fuck with physics. Because bad things can happen when Nightcrawler fucks with physics. They put Cyclops into like this gun turret thing. And make him yeah. fire his laser blast out of that. And I couldn't decide if that was very clever or very stupid. It's probably a bit of both stupid and clever. Hmm. Stupidly clever. Okay. And then Storm freezes over like a fire in space. And like, it can she controls the weather? Is there weather in space? Can I she don't know. do that? Like, she doesn't have power over temperature. She has power over climate. And I don't like... I'm not saying she would be powerless. I'm just saying I'm going to need to consult a wiki or something. Like, I'm going to have to reference some shit. And then Nightcrawler is able to teleport in with Quicksilver. And they zip all the astronauts out, except for one, the commander of the ship. And it's just like, oh no, the ship's breaking apart. We couldn't possibly do it. And Jean is just like, I could hold it together using my powers of telekinesis. And so they do that. And Nightcrawler gets the... Uh, main astronaut out but oh no Jean's still in there and the solar flare hits her and it goes into her giving her the phoenix powers except I thought she already had the phoenix powers because at the end of apocalypse she went all firebird on us what the fuck up oh yeah that happens in apocalypse I forgot 
Yeah, oh. yeah, and it seems like the writer of that movie, Simon Kimberg, forgot too. Oh God! Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, just a a little bit of consistency. Uh, no. It's it's just a little bit of consistency, guys. Just a little bit. It's all we ask for, really. Yeah. But they're able to get her out, and they fly back. And uh, Jeannie's a little bit woozy, a bit of out of it, but she appears to be fine. She says, "No, oh, I feel, I feel great." So it's like, "Oh, okay then." And then Mystique has it out with Charles, just like, "Okay, you know what? You keep sending us into dangerous situations, and when was the last time you risked something?" And then she says, "You know, uh, with all the times women have been saving people's lives around here, maybe we should be called the X Women. Think about that." And I thought, well, that would be a very uh, cool thing, except for the fact that um. We've got, like, one example of that happening in this movie. Like, the other time was, like, ten years ago, so... Yeah, that was my little pet peeve when I heard that. And I was like, show, don't tell. You didn't... Sh they didn't show us many examples of this. They only showed one. It's, yeah, back in, in the comics, so that, you know, all of the ex-women, they are... They, they do most of the work, and they're more prominent. So, in the comics, yes, that, that would be the case. But in the movie, they didn't show us that. Yeah. They just told us. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, let's count it down. How many women are in this particular X Men team? You got Storm, you got Jean, you got Mystique. Anyone else? That's it. That's it. That's that's three compared to uh, Nightcrawler, Cyclops, uh, Quicksilver, Quicksilver, Beast. Forgot Beast. Beast. So it's, de it's definitely not exactly as equal as it should be. Right. Yeah. But uh, everyone seems to be fine apart from that. And Mystique and Beast have a little get-together in the lab. But she's like, hey, remember in the first class we kind of had a romance? And uh, that was kind of sort of talked about in um, Days of Future Past. Should we continue that? Yeah, might as well. We're running out of ideas for this movie. Cool. And he talks her out of leaving the X-Men, even though that would be a very cool thing for a character. I know I would have really liked a Mystique spin-off movie, but I can't get what I want. You know, <laughs> life isn't Never fair. Get what you want. No, actually, I take that back. I'm getting a Black Widow spin-off movie. I've been saying I wanted that for years, so I'll take what I can get. You know, and uh, and then we cut to like all the X kids having a cool party out in the forest, including a little light show by Dazzler. They... I know, I saw that. I was like, yay, Dazzler! Finally, <laughs> something. Played by Halston Sage of the Orville fame. Right. So. I mean, it's not a big part, but she's there and she looks fucking she awesome. They put her yeah. in her original outfit as opposed to her updated modern outfit. So I'm okay with this. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and then Jeannie's like, oh, I feel a bit, uh, bit weird. Maybe it's all the alcohol. Uh-oh, I think I'm going to burp. And then she mind blasts everyone. It was like she went full Psyduck and everyone just knocks people over. It's a whole thing. And, right. and they take her back to the lab. And she's like, oh, okay, I feel fine. Except, no, I do not. I really don't feel okay. And then she basically says, okay, my powers are starting to lose control and everything. I don't feel safe here. I'm just going to leave. And she has it out with Cyclops, who's definitely a boyfriend at this point. And she's just like, no, I can't control my powers. I need to leave. And he's like, no, you shouldn't leave. We should stay and figure it out. And I was waiting. I was waiting for the moment when she was going to say to him, like, you don't know what it's like not to control your powers. And he's like, bitch, please. This is not a faction accessory. Like, I have to. <laughs> like, if, if this is the thing. What made one of the things that made the Cyclops Jean Grey relationship so compelling in the comics was the fact that she was at one point couldn't control her powers and he couldn't control his powers all the time. That's why he had to wear the visor. And right. it was kind of cool because in this movie in particular, he is the one person because Beast can now control his transformations for some reason. He's yeah. the one person who can understand what she's going through, understand that feeling of being out of control and potentially hurting those around them. And it's and he could have they could have had a whole conversation like I didn't give up when my first my powers first went out of control, and so, you know. If someone, imagine if someone had given up on me, like I'm not going to give up on you and it could have been a whole thing, but they never bring it up. It, it's so obvious and yet they never fucking bring it up once. Yeah, they really use, misuse 
Scott's character in this movie, I feel. When like, do they not misuse Cyclops? Let's be honest. All the time. He's my. I'll be honest. Cyclops is my was my favorite character growing up. I just really like the powers. I like the fact that there's a superhero with the same first name as me. And I just, I, I thought he was kind of cool. A lot of people don't like him nowadays due to very stupid decisions made in the comics. Time displacement! What the fuck? And, ah, <laughs> uh, and the, the movies, were, the, and he's much more prominent in this movie and in Apocalypse. And I just thought this is a chance for them to maybe get him right. And they never really have. Uh, Ty Sheridan, uh, is it Ty Sheridan who plays him in this movie? Ready Player uh, One guy. Um, yeah. He does a pretty good job. He tries his very best. Of course. But it, 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 it's just... The not, writing. It, yeah, it's the writing. It's not good enough. And so she knocks him out and fucking flees the school. At this point, the scrolls arrive. Oh, wait, no. They're <laughs> not scrolls. Why are there so many accidental references to other superhero movies? Dear God. These are actually the Dabari. Turn up. Right. Now, um, in the comics... They're the people, the alien race, whose planet, the Phoenix, when Jean Grey was possessed by the Phoenix Force, accidentally destroyed the comics. She consumed a sun, it exploded, it wiped out the whole solar system, including their home planet, so now there's only a few of them left. And it was kind of interesting to deal with the ramifications of that. Oh god, our friend, our teammate, Jean, destroyed a whole people. She committed genocide. And now there's a whole intergalactic civilization that's angry with us. Holy fuck, what are we going to do? Here, we, we know that the Phoenix Force destroyed their planet. And, a, and they plan to rebuild their civilization on this planet. And aside from that, we know fucking nothing. Yeah, they were just there. But lots of things in this movie are just there. It's just there. And they, they could have been so compelling. Like, first of all, I, I say that. First of all, they didn't need to be in the movie. They like, really didn't need to be in the movie. Because, I mean, the whole alien adventures and adventures through space thing the X-Men went on in the 1970s and the 80s and stuff like that, uh, that felt right for the X-Men of those comics because they were part of the Marvel Universe and everyone was having space adventures. Fucking Spider-Man went on space adventures a couple of times. So it happens. Uh, here, though, this is meant to be set in a much more grounded universe. A much more... Uh, it was, it's supposed to be set in the not-too-distant future, a reflection of our world. And it's meant to heighten the allegory nature of the X-Men in regards to any oppressed or repressed or persecuted minority. And it's meant to be not necessarily darker or grittier, but that is meant to be much more focused on that. And it's difficult to do that when you've got people that are, like, fucking blue. Like, there's three blue people in this movie. So, you know, it's difficult to do that sometimes. Aliens feels like a step too far. Could they have imagined a world where it wasn't a step too far? Yes, but that need to be established, like, a couple of movies ago. It's, it's kind of too late now. It's too late now, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and... And they, and, but they're in the movie. Okay, you could have made them really sympathetic. Like, our plan was destroyed. We've got nowhere else to go. We just want to create a home for ourselves. Heightening an ethical dilemma, much like happened in the comics. Nope. Here, they're definitely the bad guys. They kill people by, like, nipple twisting them to death. I, I, I don't know how, <laughs> quite how they do it. Like, the, the powers are really ambiguous. Like, they're shapeshifters, <laughs> and they're bulletproof, but they're not. And they have... Do they have psychic powers? Are they super strong? Are they super durable? We don't really get quite what's going on. And uh, the whole point is they plan to harness the Phoenix Force to rebuild their planet. Because apparently the Phoenix Force can be used for, like... Like, the Genesis device in Star Trek, apparently. I don't know. And, uh... uh and it's just like, okay, so they plan to use the Phoenix Force to rebuild the planet. And it's like, it, well, if they can control the Phoenix Force, how did it destroy their planet? Right. It, there's, a, there's a lot of gaps here. And the there's main, a lot of gaps. The, the main uh, alien, the main one of the Dabari, is called, uh, what's her name? Is it Nux? Vux? Von? Yeah, Vux. Vuck. Vuck. It's Vuck. I don't, I don't, it's... Her, her name's Vuck, <laughs> but we just know her as Jessica Chastain, 
And we're just, we're just yeah. going to refer to her as Jessica Chastain for the whole movie. I'm just going to say this. I don't want to offend anyone out there or upset anyone. I don't like making fun of people's physical appearance. But I'm just going to say it. People with blonde eyebrows look fucking creepy. A little, yeah. Like, not even people with... Because it makes them look like they have no eyebrows, but worse. Like, I find people with no eyebrows significantly less creepy. Like, that guy from Barry and Gotham who played Victor Zaz. Like, that guy, I don't find that very creepy at all. In terms of physical looks. Uh, but Jessica Chastain in this movie just looks fucking creepy. And maybe that was kind of the point. But then why did she take on human form? And it's like, uh, why? Why? It's, why? And she plans to use the Phoenix Force to, you know, take over the world. Nah, 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 nah. And uh, meanwhile, the X-Men are tracking down uh, Jean. And uh, they discover through Charles that he actually tinkered with her mind a little bit after her parents supposedly died and they're not very happy about that and I'm thinking wait wait didn't we cover this in X-Men The Last Stand like I know this whole thing was like to redo the the, the bad things that happened in X-Men The Last Stand fine fair enough but that's a direct plot point from that as we, we've done this and that was written by the same fucking guy again I can't take this. Ugh. And Mystique in particular, um, Mystique and Beast call him out on this. Just like, whoa, you really shouldn't have done that? Meddling with people's minds, Charles? And it's just like, she was very dangerous and I had to do it just like to help her and shit. And, he's, and they're like, no, fucking no. It's not cool, Charles. Not cool. And so they, and Jean Meeswild goes to her old house because she hears like her father's vo thoughts in her mind. And she finds, ruh ro, her dad's alive! Jerry, 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 Jerry! <laughs> but, but it turns out... <laughs> turns out, though, he, uh, he's not too happy to see her. And he willfully kept away from her all these years because he was afraid of what she would do. And he didn't know how to look after her. And she does not respond to that very well at all. And then the X-Men turn up and just like, hey, Jean, um, can we talk? And Cyclops is about to go up to her. And then Mystique is like, no, no, I'm going to talk with her. I'm just like, uh, why? Wouldn't, again, wouldn't Cyclops make more sense to talk with her? But no, Mystique goes up and she's like, hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to talk to you right now. Let's, uh, let's, uh, sort this shit out. And, uh, Jean starts to lose control again. She goes, mm -hmm. boom. And she impales Mystique on a big bit of wood. Yep. And then we slowly see Mystique, this character who's been a huge part of the X-Men franchise, who's been a main part of uh, ever si of the uh, franchise ever since X-Men First Class, who's arguably had the best character arc and best character development of the whole movie, been the most significant character, finally gets out of a contract and doesn't have to put on all the blue makeup anymore. Pretty much. Because it's no secret that Jennifer Lawrence didn't really want to do this anymore. And um, I get it. She wants to do other things. She wants to make other movies. Fine. Fair enough. Here's the thing, though. Jennifer Lawrence, I love you. You're an excellent actress and by all accounts, a pretty great human being. But you were more than happy to be part of this franchise when you were starting out, when your star was just starting to shoot off into the stratosphere... And now that you're a fully established actor, you don't want any part of it. Well, tough shit. Don't sign on to a franchise then. All you know, right. that requires you to get into all of that makeup. I get it. Like you maybe didn't know what it was going to be like when you first signed on. And I get that the movies aren't quite as good. These last past two movies. But like fucking hell, you made your bed. Lie in it. But it's, it's too late now. These are the end of these mainstream uh, X-Men Fox movies. So she's out, she's gone, and she's gone for the rest of the movie. And you, and it's, it's, it's kind of an impactful moment. And you think, oh my god, does this mean like a lot of the X-Men are going to die? Fucking no! They all live. Going to spoil that right now for you. And um, Quicksilver tries to take her out and tries to stop her. But Phoenix gets rid of him. She knocks him out for the rest of the movie. Because as we all know... Yeah. Quicksilver is the answer to everyone's problems. 
Right, exactly. That's why they got rid of him in the beginning. Yep, it's just like, quick, take him out before he solves everything. Just like, ah. And uh, Jean flies off again, and the X-Men are forced to mourn their fallen comrade, and they have a big old funeral for Mystique, and then we get a whole scene with Beast and Charles in the kitchen. And it's probably one of the best scenes in the movie. Uh, Charles is like, I'm, this is the, I met her in this kitchen. This is where we first met. And this is where we first officially became like brother and sister. And Beast is like, hey, I loved her. But uh, side note, um, just in case you didn't know, uh, her death, totes your fault. Completely yeah. your fault. And they have it out. And, just, and Charles is just like, you know, um, I just buried my foster sister. Maybe you might want to wait a little while before having it out with me. And he's like, no, we're going to have it out now. And it brings up this whole thing of Charles using people to further his agenda for mutant equality. Now, some people have said that this is not a very good thing. They don't like this in this new movie. That's fair enough. I would argue <laughs> it's the most interesting thing about the movie. Because, here's the thing. Professor X in the comics did this sort of thing actually all the, time. All the fucking time. <laughs> he manipulated time. people since day one. And yep. it was always for the greater good. At least that's how he justified it. But I, th I thought it was most okay. interesting. And it's a flaw. Yes, it's a flaw in his character. But it's an interesting flaw. It's an intriguing flaw. It's a bit of character development for him. Because, we I mean, in the first movie, he was just like the fresh-faced, baby-faced uh, Charles Xavier. He was just like, hey, uh, mutations, kind of groovy. And in uh, X-Men uh, Days of Future Past, he was kind of this broken figure who had this glorious dream that got ruined and now he's sunk very low. And in X-Men Apocalypse, he was there. So th his, his development kind of spotted a bit, kind of faltered. And here, it's actually showing the darker side of him. Something that the, uh, the pre-rebooted X-Men movies didn't really do. They kind of touched upon it in, in Last Stand. And it was interesting to see, like... Uh, Professor X's dark past come back to haunt him but it never really went far enough with it and it was always kind of justified in that movie because in that movie uh, Phoenix was a very much destructive force that was like a split personality thing mm -hmm. so he absolutely was justified in what he did less so here and it makes for a more compelling character and a much more interesting counter arc and this sort of schism in the X-Men and it, it's kind of cool uh, meanwhile uh, while that's going on uh, Jean Grey uh, goes back to go, so goes to uh, it's never said it's Genosha but let's just fucking call it Genosha it's basically yeah. this island in the middle of the sea with uh, Magneto running a small like um, hippie community I guess it's very agriculture and like as much as Ch uh, Charles gets some cool development in this movie and Magneto does not. It's like, oh, Magneto's settled down. He's trying to leave his violent past behind him. I wonder if something will bring him out of his violent past and force him to put on his Magneto helmet again. Because we haven't seen that ever. And so, mm. but, you know, he's settling down and he sees Jean. He's like, hey, Jean, what's up? Did Charles send you? She's like, no, I actually, uh, I need help because like, my powers are out of control. And he's like, I can see that. You got blood on you. Whose blood, on the whose blood is that? Whose blood is that? Whose blood is that? Seriously, whose blood is that? And she never answers him. It gets right. kind of annoying. And then some soldiers sent by the military who've been tracking. Oh, oh, oh God, this brings me to like ever since uh, Jean uh, went kablooey and uh, when she went kablooey, she kind of destroyed a house and um, the police showed up. She kind of attacked him. <laughs> And this causes the president to cut off all communication with Charles. And some people in, in the US government bring up the idea of mutant camps. And just like, so 10 years of progressive mutant <laughs> civilized rights just wiped away in one afternoon. Yeah, that escalated really quickly. Way too quickly. And it's just like, it's, I mean... I know I don't want to draw any direct parallels between the current U.S. government because that's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down. But right. it's, just, it's like one protest turned violent, and suddenly it's just like, okay, bring back, don't ask, don't tell. As like, no, no, 
And not even that. That doesn't even... Not even that. Uh, it's, it's, it's fucking stupid. It's stupid. And it's just like, I understand why the president would express concern. And, and Charles could like to have to bluff and blag, say, no, 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 everything's fine. Don't worry. I'm on top of this because I'm the poster child for mutants. <laughs> Guys, find her, find her. But that doesn't really happen. And it's, it's just... Uh, it's, 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 it's stupid. It's lazy writing. It's lazy writing. And... Hello. Yeah. And... Uh, but then, uh, so a bunch of, because of this, a bunch of soldiers turn up in Genosis saying, hey, uh, have you seen uh, Jean Grey? And Magnus just like, um, get the fuck out, you're not supposed to be here. And he's like, oh no, we're going to search this place and we're going to find her if she's here. If not, you've got nothing to worry about. And I keep on thinking like, um, and, and they bring up some le like legal points, just like this is supposed to be sovereign territory given to me by the U.S. government, and the U.S. government, and they say well, the U.S. government could take it back. We're not here to take it back. We're just here to have a look around. And I keep on thinking like, okay, so he's going to stall them, make them leave, or maybe give Jean up or something, or maybe hide Jean. No, no, no. Jean strolls out and starts attacking soldiers left, right, and center. I'm just like, okay, congratulations, G. You chose the worst possible outcome for this scenario. Very, yeah. Uh, and it makes me yeah. wonder, is she, like, being driven crazy by the Phoenix Force? Because it seems like she might be doing that. Or is she just stupid? I mean, it could be either. It could just be bad writing. It could be either. Yeah. Bad writing. Yeah, and the, uh, she eventually drives the, um, Soldiers off. Magneto just tries to protect them, and they run the fuck out. And she and he's like, "Okay, so you need to GTFO. Like, you need. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to pull for my Chris Rock folder. You got to go." That right. One. I like to apologize for that terrible Chris Rock impression, but uh, <laughs> it's a terrible movie. I'm not going to bring my A game. I'm not going to bring my A material. You know. And so, <laughs> and so, Gene. Um. Jean runs to a bar and is approached by creepy Jessica Chastain, who tries to convince her, like, hey, I can help you win everything, and takes her into the middle of New York. And at this point, uh, Beast has hiotated away from the X-Men and has gone to uh, Magneto. And he says, hey, Mags, uh, so um, Jean killed Raven, and I was in love with her, and you were sort of in love with her for a while there, and we both really cared about her. Uh, do you want to team up and kill Jean with me? And Mags is like, yeah, sure, I've got nothing else to do today. I mean, it's like, it's either that or, you know, pick the rutabagas. And this seems like it might be more fun. So they go to New York, accompanied by a guy who can control his hair. Uh-huh. And, and not even, like, in a cool Medusa way, like, from an Inhuman. So he just, like, whips people, like, with his dead dreadlocks. He's just like, yeah, yeah, I whip my hair back and forth. I whip my hair back and forth. And this other character... Who, if I just check on Wikipedia, is just for a second, just check who this character is. Uh, Celine? What the fuck? Celine! This uh, is Celine! Okay. Do you know who Celine is? Uh, I don't know. Who is Celine? Celine, in the comics, is a member of the Hellfire Club. She's known as the Black Queen. And um, you know how Emma Frost in the comics is the White Queen and she's Correct. kind of a bitch even on her good days? Yeah. Well, uh, Celine is like Emma Frost, but with every single shred of moral integrity, real or imagined, just completely removed. She is like this energy vampire who is uh, this pure evil She's pure evil. Like, um, the big... I, I never saw that much of her in the comics, but when I was a kid, I read these X-Men books focused around, uh, the X-Men and Beast interacting with the Hellfire Club to find a cure for the legacy <laughs> virus, which is basically, like, their big metaphor for the AIDS virus. Right. Uh, in comics. And it was this huge thing. It was a very... It was, like, three books. Very well written, I will say. And they made Celine truly scary like on par with like a, a Stephen King villain okay I mean maybe it's just the way I remember it reading it as a kid but it she was truly terrifying 
And here, she's just like mildly sassy and has a there? knife and has psychic powers. She's just there. She's just there. And it's just like, for the most part, with these X-Men movies, they've been pretty well representative of the characters. Like, Cyclops kind of reminds me of Cyclops. X-Men, Professor X reminds me of X- Professor X. Uh, for the most part. This is, this is just like, no. Better you just make up a character, like Hair, hair Guy. Like, I don't know his name, I'm just going to call him Hair Guy. And apparently he was going to be this, meant to be this X-Men character called Hair Red... Guy. Yeah, uh, he's supposed to be like this character called like Red Lotus, but they changed it. Just like make up a new character. Uh, uh, random. Like there are so many X Men characters. There are literally hundreds. I know. Literally hundreds. Like you just pick a Morlock. Pick any of the Morlocks. Like there's tons of them. Reuse one that you've already had. Make another Callisto. You've or, or Toad. You've done that before. Why not? But no. And so they go to kill um, Jean Grey along with Beast. And uh, Nightcrawler teleports himself, Charles, Storm, and Cyclops to them to stop them. And they have a big old fight in the streets of New York. And there's this thing that happens. Um, Cyclops' uh, optic blasts ricochet off of things. Can can they do that? Oh, yeah. He did that with the mirror on the car. I don't know if he... that... Because they're concussive blasts. They're meant to be like... Not really heat or energy. Well, they are energy, but not like heat or electricity so much as just like pure force. So maybe they could ricochet, but then like the his ultimate enemy is just like a guy dressed in a, a mirror. Like you see those like uh, street performance art people like dressed in like mirror shards and stuff like that. Yeah. Like that's his ultimate villain. Like. Look out, ex- Cyclops! I'm your greatest arch nemesis, Refracto. <laughs> it's it, it's kind of stu- it's kind of stu- I know he uses it like cleverly in combat, but it, it's kind of weird. And I will say the effects in this movie and the action scenes in this movie are pretty good for the most part. A couple of times like eh, but for the most part they're pretty cool. And the probably the most cool thing is when Magneto tears a subway car. Out from below the street to block the entrance of the house he's going in to kill Jean in. Like, that was, really cool. that was very fucking cool. But while that's going on, Charles has made his way into the uh, the house. And he finds Jean talking with uh, Jessica Chastain. And it's basically just like the angel and devil <laughs> on her shoulder trying to convince her like... Hey, I can help you. No, Gene, I can help you. No, I can help you. Trust me. No, trust me. The guy you've literally known, like, since you were eight years old. But, like, you betrayed me. But you don't know her. It's like, ah. Uh. And then there's a scene where Gene telekinetically forces Charles out of his chair to walk up the stairs. He's like, Gene, no, stop it. Stop and- that. That's really bad. I, that was cringy. That was really. Like, I mean, there's three reactions you could have to this. Like, genuinely scared and intimidated, like, oh shit, that's actually kind of, whoa, cringy, as you say. Or the third one, which is my reaction, is to immediately have in your head, I've got no strings to hold me down. Da, 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 da. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of gives you that sort of thing. And then Gene sort of goes into his mind, and it, it's revealed that the reason why he did all the horrible things he did to her is because... Her dad willingly gave her up because, like, he didn't want anything to do with her. And she said that she was beyond fixing. But he didn't believe that. And it's kind of a sweet thing. But they kind of frame it like they're trying to justify what he did. And it's like, no, the whole point was there was no justification. He could have just talked with her about it. Like, yeah, okay, it makes him much more trustworthy. A much, much better person than Jessica Chastain. But it still, it doesn't excuse what he did. Right. And at that point, uh, the uh, the fuzz shows up and they arrest everyone except for the aliens. And in the comics and uh, various expanded media like cartoons and stuff, uh, the people who deal with mutants are known as the MRD, the Mutant Response Division. Here, I notice they're known as the Mutant Control Unit or MCU. Ooh, is someone trying to throw some shade? <laughs> Only throw shade when you have a good movie. Yeah. 
Yeah, like, hey Marvel, like, hey look at us, you're like the bad guys in our movie. That is possibly the worst reviewed X-Men movie to date, whilst you just had possibly the greatest superhero movie of all time. Ha. And so they all get transported on this train thing, with like mutant with straight collars dampening their powers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um... And they keep on warring the uh, the MCU. Uh, you gotta stop. That, like aliens are gonna show up and they're gonna like attack you. You need to help. And one uh, guard s- says to Nightcrawler, "Like, hey, my kid used to be a big fan of yours." And it's like, well, like it's been a day since the X Men supposedly rent Rogue. I imagine like the kid still is. Like you know, give it a give him a while. <laughs> right. And then the aliens attack. And that same uh, guard just says, ah, you know what, fuck it, and releases the X-Men. And it's basically just like a fucking 10-minute action scene, which at times looks cool and times doesn't, because this is when the whole alien powers thing really becomes a bit uh, ambiguous, because like sometimes they have attacks that they give to the aliens that really work, and sometimes they give the same attacks and they don't work. And it's basically them just trying to get to Jean all the while... um, uh, Jessica Chastain has managed to absorb some of her powers. Right. Uh, and at this point, like, uh, the X-Men have put their differences aside. Magneto and Charles made up. Beast and Charles made up. Charles has admitted he's wrong. So they're all working together. Celine and Hair Guy get taken out pretty fucking easily. And yeah. uh, the uh, the cop that uh, Nightcrawler said that his kid was a fan of Nightcrawlers dies. And Nightcrawler's like, no, no, no. And then he goes ape shit and starts stabbing people. Shit. Like, in the yep. comics, uh, Nightcrawl... I hate to keep doing that in the comics, but the comics yeah. are better. So, you know. In the comics, Nightcrawler has, like, these swords. And he's, like, a bit of a swashbuckler. And he, like, goes on guard. And I thought, oh, cool. Are we going to get a bit of something like that? No, he just starts stabbing people. And, like, he... And there's one point I couldn't quite tell. Did he... Dara, did he stab someone in the neck with the point of his tail? Yeah. I don't think his tail works like that. Like, it's just flesh and cartilage. It's not, like, sharp enough. Like, it, it, it's pointy, but it, it, it's not going to work like that. It, it, no, no, it's... It, it, no, it's it's pointy like some people's fingers are pointy. Like, it's not going... You, you can't drive... It with enough force to pierce someone's neck, especially an alien or something like that. It, it's just no, no. Like if he was holding a knife in his tail, that would make sense. And there's one point where he strangles someone with his tail. But yeah, that makes sense. But no, fucking no. This is basic, guys. Come on, it's not a bladed tail. God, and um, and it sort of culminates. With um, Jean waking up and saving everyone. Magneto like crushes a bunch of the aliens in the train car. I don't know why he didn't that to begin with. Instead of just like using a bunch of guns that clearly didn't work after the first couple of rounds. And um, this is the point where you think, okay, cool. We're going to get a huge like space battle in between like the two Phoenix Force users. Except no, because that will be a bit similar to another Marvel movie that came out recently. Cough, cough, Captain Marvel, cough, cough. And so um, they have it on the street. Jean absorbs like the rest of the Phoenix Force, kills all the rest of the aliens that survived, flies off into the sky, becomes like the Phoenix, supposedly transcends a physical form or something. I don't care. And I will say the effects on Sophie Turner when she's truly becoming the phoenix and stuff like that she looks kind of glorious yeah it was really nice she she glows and she looks all she looks like a fucking goddess i'll say that much like yeah yeah definitely take that khaleesi i've got my own glow up (laughs) yeah so uh but she goes boom and oh god what else happens well let's uh, the X-Men basically says, Ma, she's dead. Oh, no. What a shame. What a pity. Uh, and uh, she kind of just, like, disappears in outer space. 
The school yeah. is renamed the Jean Grey School for Gifted Youngsters, as it is in the comics, except that's yeah. kind of inappropriate now because, like, she killed people. Like, name it after Mystique. Like, because she yeah. was right there from the beginning. That would be more appropriate. Hank becomes, like, the new headmaster. Professor X retired. And the team sort of, like, rallies together. It's just like, hey, we're still the X-Men. Like, we're still going to keep going until Charles goes senile and kills us all. You know? Yeah. That, that'll be fun. And, uh... <laughs> and Charles retires and goes to Paris. He meets up with, uh... Magneto and they have a game of chess because that's all they fucking do at the end of these movies. Just like, well, Charles, it looks like the movie's starting to end. I think it's about time we have some chess. Oh, very well, Eric, very well. And then we see in the sky, flaming in the skies of Paris, a flaming phoenix. And it's like, okay, cool. And uh, is there a post credit scene? Oh. No, fucking no. I waste my time waiting. I didn't wait. <laughs> yeah. Good. I just laughed. Good for you. Good for you. I wish I hadn't waited. They need to put that in the front of the... I need to put that in the movie. Like, there is no post credit scene. Just, just warn people. And that's how the main X-Men movies end. But there is a glimmer of hope because there is another Fox-led X-Men movie on the horizon. New Mutants, which right. after a bit of faff, is definitely gonna come out. I believe it's not being made by Kimberg. It is, in fact, uh, when's it coming out? Just double checking. Okay, so it's it's been slated for release in the United States in April next year, in 2020. It's been uh, directed by, okay. it's been con produced by Kimberg, but it's been written by uh, and directed by Josh Boone and some guy called. Kanate, Kanate Lee. I don't know how, how to pronounce it, sorry. And uh, remember I said that something about this movie made me really fucking angry? Well, here it is. Boom pitched this as a horror movie. He wanted it to be an R-rated superhero horror movie featuring these young kids, the New Mutants. And he had a really clear creative vision. And Fox were like, that ah, sounds pretty good. And then they sort of backed out of that and saying, oh, no, 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 no. It, doesn't, it can't be R-rated. It shouldn't be R-rated. It, uh, <laughs> you know, we can't make it a horror film horrifying. We need to get the kids in. Yeah. And despite the fact that the same people made Deadpool. I know, right? <laughs> they made Deadpool. I don't know what their problem is. And it's like, oh, no, because people don't watch horror films. Horror films can't be fucking, uh, you know, profitable, despite the fact that the Conjuring franchise is the most pop one of the most popular film franchises outside of the MCU right now. Horror yeah. film is so in. It's insane that they thought this. It's insane. If I was in that room, I would slap them all in the face. I don't <laughs> care. Let's like no. Pay fucking attention, you dumb shits. Like, it's insane. Oh, why? Why would you think that? And then, wouldn't you know it, they turned around and realised, oh, wait, yeah, yeah, fucking R-rated movies are, uh, are really popular right now. So then the film has been delayed for two years, for reshoots, which always works out so well. Let's, oh, let's okay. list the last X-Men movie that got a lot of reshoots. X-Men Origins Wolverine. Yeah, and like the Justice League. And Rogue One. It's like, fuck. And I'm not saying the movie's going to be bad. It's not, but it's just like... Uh, so it turns out, apparently, our, our rated movies are, are profitable. You don't say. And it's, it makes me so fucking angry. Because these executives, these people who are in charge of these producers, are supposed to be like the top of the field. They're supposed to know what's current, what's cutting edge. And this guy came up with something that was, he called a, a breath of fresh air. That's something that could be really, really cool and interesting and would work. And it's like... Superheroes, popular right now. Horror films, popular right now. He saw the writing on the wall and bridged the two. And these geniuses said no. And the only good thing about this is that this is going to be the last Fox-made uh, X-Men movie featuring right. the mutants 
Uh, I'm not big on the new mutants. I don't know that much about them. Uh, the only character I really like a lot, and I do like her a lot, is Rain Sinclair, aka Wolfsbane. Uh, she's a Scottish mutant who's always struggled with her ability to turn into her wolf versus her religious beliefs. Played by Maisie Williams. So that's two Game of Thrones actors who are in these X-Men movies. Hopefully Maisie's, hey, hopefully Maisie's the, uh, is the Stark sister who's been going to be able to turn this whole thing around. And... Uh, God, it's... And then... Uh, who knows? There's no... I mean, the X-Men aren't really slated for anything in the MCU after this. Uh, I don't know what the status is on The Gifted or Legion, and at this point, I don't really care. Like, they're good shows, but I just don't care about them anymore. Just, I, re yeah. I really went off them. I went off The Gifted because of that fucking kid. That, you know, the two kids, the two original kids they created for the show. The boy yeah. kid in that. I like the girl kid and I, the actress playing that. The boy kid in that. I fucking hate because like, I get where they're going for him with that because like they're meant to like oh he's meant to be the beginning of this really dark character the polar opposite of his sister who's meant to be like much better but and it's like but he's not really a, like a dark superhero in the making he's just a fucking whiny kid who needs to take an intro to philosophy class that that's it yeah that's fucking it and that's what we're left with we're left with two semi-decent tv series that I'll watch anymore uh, an upcoming horror film that could be good, assuming the producers get the thumbs out of their asses, written by a guy who did The Fault in Our Stars, which I haven't seen, but I've heard good things, you know. And, yeah. and that's it. We're yet to get an X-23 spin-off movie, which I'm fucking pissed about. And, mm -hmm. and we end the mainstream X-Men movies that's been going... For nearly 20 years, on a 22% yep. on Rotten Tomatoes as of the date of recording. It's the, arguably, people have said that it's the most disappointing, anticlimactic, and bad, certainly the most worst reviewed X-Men movie since the year 2000, which is saying something. And I'm just going to say it. I don't think it's that bad. Like, I think it's bad... Don't get me wrong. I don't think it's... A, right. It's... It's... It's a, not a good movie, but it's not 22% Rotten Tomatoes bad. I get no. that maybe because it's disappointing, and it is very disappointing, but there it are is. some good effects, some a lot of good action scenes, some good yeah. performances, some good right. themes, some character development here and there. It's... It, it's few and far between, but it's there, and it's just a lot of stuff happening, and like... Last Stand, I think, is worse by leaps and bounds. Uh, yeah. Wolverine, X-Men Origins Wolverine is worse by leaps and bounds. Fan Four Stick, don't even compare the two. This, oh. I mean, Fan Four Stick makes this movie seem like Citizen fucking Kane. Oh, okay. So, so I really don't know what to say. Like, I wish I could hate this movie almost, because then, like, I would feel something. Or I wish I could love this movie because then I could say, no, the haters are wrong and it's actually really, really good. But I can't even say that. All I can say is the people who say it's absolute dreck are only kind of right. It's just partially dreck, which is kind of the worst thing you could say about it beyond even 0%. Because, like, people watch 0% movies on Rotten Tomatoes all the time. Like, people watch Birdemic yeah. and The Room and they love those movies because they make them feel something like joy at how much of a train wreck it is. I watch this movie, I don't feel joy, I don't feel hatred, I feel nothing except maybe slight disappointment at the potential for what could have been. Yep. What are your thoughts? Do you have any extra thoughts? I, it, it felt really, like, I was disappointed because I loved the X-Men animated series when I was, when which, I was a kid. Which and... one? Which one? Because there's more than one. The very first one from the early 90s. What? Oh, okay. So not the pride of the X-Men. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all love that. I mean, that's the thing. So actually, um, like, uh, actually, on that note, there's been talks. The original makers of that show have approached Disney and Disney Plus to continue the TV series. That continue that specific animated show. And I humbly suggest that this is a terrible idea. It is a terrible idea. 
Yeah. Would you like to tell the capers why? Uh, because it's not going to be as good as you remember. And they're just going to mess it up. Yeah, and and even if it was, like, even if it was just as good, like, we've moved on. The way they told that story was fine for the 90s. But it hasn't dated very exactly. well. It hasn't aged well. We've moved on. X-Men right. have moved on. Like, I love my X-Men cartoon series was X-Men Evolution, which actually introduced uh, characters like Spike and X-23. Right. And uh, I really like that show. I'm not going to tell like it's perfect. It's got some issues here and there and some stuff that's kind of disappointing. But for the yep. most part, it's really, really good. A little dated here and there. But for the most part, I think it holds up. And it certainly had left much more of an impact that with me. Yeah. It, it had a more impact with me than, say, uh, X-Men the Animated Series or even Wolverine and the X-Men or the X-Men mm-hmm. anime. Did you even watch that? I watched... I got through, like, one episode and I couldn't really finish it. Same. Same. Sorry. Like, I... Uh, and, yeah. and uh, just much before that. And so we, we've moved on in terms of storytelling. Our cartoons now, in terms of superhero cartoons, have moved on. Like, yep. most of them are shit except for the ones being made with DC. Like, I, I really do not like the Marvel cartoons right now. I, I've, I've made it clear my feelings on how I think they're cheap and lazy and just uninteresting. Yeah. Yeah. And as much as I would kind of like an X-Men cartoon from the original creators of the uh, first animated one to uh, sort of spice things up a bit, you just know they're not going to give them the actual proper budget. They're not going to... Nope. They're not going to get... I don't know, they worked on a shooting budget before, but our styles of animation have moved on since then. And exactly. cheap animation back then is very different from cheap animation right now. So, yeah. And so I just... I, I, I'm... I feel weird. I feel kind of ungrateful because Marvel, in terms of their cinematic properties, are doing so well and it's what I've wanted for so long. And I just right. kind of wanted that for X-Men too because before we had great Marvel movies, we just had great X-Men movies until we suddenly didn't. Exactly. And it's it's a little disappointing. But, you know, the future, we don't know what the future holds. And maybe one day the X-Men will return. Right. Possibly in small spin-offs leading to a big team up like with the Avengers, or possibly just reintroducing mutants as a whole, who knows, into the MCU. Who knows? And I'm confident that when that happens, it'll be good. I'd like to see a Gambit or X twenty three movie. Hell, they teamed up in the comics at one point, I know that much, so maybe both yeah. of them, like teaming up. Or an or a Gambit and Rogue movie with Rogue who can actually fly and use super strength, like in the fucking right. comics. Yeah. Meh. As long, you know, I'll be happy. I will be happy as long as they don't go back to just making Wolverine movies. Right. Yeah, we don't need any more Wolverine movies. Yeah. So sorry, and I, I, I just, I just need time. I need time to get over no more Hugh Jackman. Like, I, I need to yep. mourn. I still have, I still have it. Do you hear the Wolverine <laughs> scratching his beer and spelling Bob? Oh boy. Oh God, it's. Uh, <laughs> now I'm getting Logan flashbacks. I mean, yeah, I think that was was that the last good X Men movie, Logan? It must have been. Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, I didn't know Deadpool mm-hmm. two. Let Deadpool two. Yeah, Deadpool two was alright. Yeah, and yeah, we we don't we're not even we're not even gonna get like an X Men. A new X Men cartoon or anything like that. It's, they're all just so Marvel's been so focused on its properties that it owned for now. Now, thanks to the uh, Fox merger, yeah, it's just sort of caught them by surprise a little bit because they've like this is the problem when you have a set concrete structure and plan, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe does. It's difficult to incorporate new properties you get into it. But maybe they will. Like they they managed to insert Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch in there. Uh, maybe they'll find other ways of doing that. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, and I think maybe the future's bright as long as uh, A, they don't involve Simon Kinberg. Right. B, they don't involve Brett Ratner. Mm-hmm. And C, they don't involve Brian Singer. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, because that's two. That's two known unprofessional some part alleged and part no we definitely know this abusers they hire yeah. as directors and it's just like maybe let's not do that anymore oh. yeah 
And so, <laughs> let's not do that anymore. Is there anything right. else you want to say about this movie or the X-Men franchise in general? Um, I like, uh, I want to go back to when, uh, the New York scene, when, um, Charles and his group showed up and they, him and Magneto had a conversation and Magneto was like, nobody cares. And I feel like that how, is how I feel. I, I, I didn't care enough sorry, about this sorry. movie and that's why I didn't. Sorry, could you cut out? Could you start again? Sorry. Sorry, it's okay. Um, when Magneto was talking to Charles in, in New York, he said, you always give a speech and, and guess what? Nobody cares anymore. Hmm. And I think that kind of like sums up how everyone feels now. It sums up the movie energy, the franchise entirely. Like it's intended as this cool sort of like character development moment for Charles. Like you keep on making excuses. You keep on making apologies and there's big speeches and you know it just doesn't work anymore. And now exactly. it's just like you keep on making these movies and now we just don't care anymore. And I can't help but wonder if this is how the MCU will end, you know? Maybe oh. one day in the future, maybe we'll get into this. And But all we can say for certain is this is how the mainstream Fox Expo movies end. Not with yep. a bang, but with a whimper. And on that note, I think we're going to end yep. the show. Thank you very much, Dara, for joining me today. Yep. No problem. It's... Have fun. Oh, I... Fun's an odd word to describe this whole ordeal. Yeah. And if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends, shout out from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and... Uh, if you... Sorry, let me start again. And if you enjoy the show too, Capers, please tell your friends, shout out from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes, like our Logan episode we did way back when. That's a lot more fun than this movie. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, Poppy, YouTube, Spotify, or podcapers.com. We have a Patreon. Check out the rewards. Patreon.com forward slash AP2HYC. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AP2HYC, or email us at podcapers at AP2HYC.com. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Podcapers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!